Today's video is brought to you by Man and Witch, The Dance of a Thousand Steps. Hi, I'm Kyle Anderson. That gum you like is coming back in style, and I'm here to talk to you about more cartoons. For over 30 years, the DC Animated Universe has been the pinnacle of animated comic book storytelling. Beginning in 1992 with the legendary Batman the Animated Series, the universe created by Bruce Timm, Eric Radomski, Paul Dini, Alan Burnett, and dozens of other luminaries maintained a consistent continuity in visual style, crossover characters, and narrative. After Batman, we got Superman the Animated Series, The New Batman Adventures, Batman Beyond, Static Shock, Justice League, and Justice League Unlimited, not to mention several direct-to-video features that continue to this day. Tim's triumphant return to the Batman universe, Batman Caped Crusader, is set to premiere on Prime August 1st. While similar in design aesthetic to Batman the Animated Series, this show sets the events and characters back in the original Bob Kane and Bill Finger 1940s, including Batman's purple gloves. But while Tim gets rightful plaudits for his work in DC animation, another Batman series carried the torch on terrestrial television for five seasons that drastically changed the character designs and vibe of Gotham City. This series was would be a counterpart to the soon-to-release reboot film Batman Begins, which placed the Dark Knight in his earliest time with the cape and cowl. That's right, we're celebrating the 20th anniversary of The Batman, which debuted on Kids WB in September 2004. Dear God, that was 20 years ago. Hi, I'm Kyle, an ambulatory pillar of dust. I never watched The Batman when it aired because I was in college. But more than that, I, like many DCAU fans, halfway resented the series for not having Kevin Conroy as the titular hero. It wasn't until a few years ago, when the feature film The Batman came out, that I finally gave the cartoon The Batman a fair shake. And guess what? <laughs> Great. No, it's not as good as Batman the Animated Series, but that's like being mad your delicious cheeseburger weren't made by a Michelin star chef. If you've never seen The Batman, allow me to give you a crash course in why it's worth your time. Part 1. The Concept Batman Begins, as you well know, places Bruce Wayne at the beginning of his costume crusade against crime and corruption in Cotham. I mean, I mean Gotham. That movie was due out in summer 2005 with Christopher Nolan planning a franchise. Because we live in the future, we know that trilogy would make not a little amount of money, but in fact, a great deal of it. For an animated series to go back to Batman's early days, it was decided it should be distinct and outside the continuity of the DCAU. After all, Batman Mask of the Phantasm dealt a lot with Bruce's beginnings and Batman Beyond had already detailed a rookie, so they had done it. The Batman picks up three years into young Bruce Wayne's nightly exploits. The series was developed by Michael Gogan and Dwayne Kupitzi, with Kupitzi handling head writer duties for the first three and a bit seasons. To make it visually different, the art direction and character design work fell to Jeff Matsuda, known for his distinct style on the Jackie Chan adventures. This was a smart idea. Tim's designs are iconic, and for this show to set itself apart, it'd need something equally recognizable. In a lot of ways, the series' ethos was to completely rethink all or most of the well-known tropes and characters in the Batman mythos. Bruce, at the beginning of the series, essentially only has Alfred Pennyworth as an ally and only some of his gadgetry. He'd slowly acquire more allies and eventually sidekicks as the series progressed, as well as upgrading his Batmobile and cadre of tools. Playing Batman in this iteration is Canadian voice actor Reno Romano, who had previously provided the voice of Spider-Man in a number of early 2000s PlayStation games, as well as the 1999 animated series Spider-Man Unlimited. Romano gives Bruce the youthful playboy energy he needs while still imbuing the Batman with the necessary menace. I'll take Riddler. I also want to share the only two pieces of information from from the personal life section of Reno Romano's Wikipedia page. First, he dated fellow actor Catherine Fiore in 1999. Second, in 2018, he sold his home in Hollywood Hills West for $1.647 million. Why am I telling you this? I don't know. Why the hell is it on the Wikipedia page? Who gives a sh Commissioner Gordon first appears at the end of the second season, and the third season sees his daughter Barbara Gordon join the fracas as Batgirl. There was a weird thing in DC animation in the 2000s, which has been called the Bat Embargo, essentially because the Batman, Justice League, and Teen Titans were all on the air at the same time, no character could appear on more than one series, with the lone exception of Batman himself in both The Batman and Justice League. There's more to this than meets the eye. By the time of the Batman season four, Teen Titans had ended, meaning the Bat Embargo was up, and Robin was introduced into the Batman. While I love that they brought in the Bat family for this series, 
It does therefore mean Batgirl and especially Robin are incredibly young, which kind of lessens the danger of the particular circumstances. Like, 20-something Dick Grayson feels like he could die. 10-year-old Dick Grayson, far less so. Effectively, once Robin joins the series, Batgirl starts to take a back seat, and by the time of the fifth and final season, Barbara is in four episodes while Robin is in 12. That's one of my few complaints about the series, but we'll get into that later. We'll start discussing the individual seasons in a bit, but for now, part two, the villains. Even more so than Batman himself, the series completely remixed and reimagined the familiar rogues gallery of Batman baddies, changing their look, their aesthetic, and at times, even their identities. Due to the Nolan movies, certain villains were off-limits for the show. Ergo, the Batman was not able to incorporate Scarecrow, Ra's al Ghul, or Two-Face into the show's canon. Despite the Joker being pinned for Nolan's second film, this series could still use him pretty much because what's Batman without the Joker? Also, what's Joker without the Batman besides an Oscar-winning film? The Joker had one of the most drastic changes on the show. Instead of the cold, cackling derangement of Mark Hamill's Joker, this version of the Joker reads more like the evil 1930s Daffy Duck, bouncing off the walls, even incorporating a straitjacket into his costume at times. This version has a more monstrous, hulking physicality and enormous locks of hair. Topping the entire character off is a delightfully unleashed performance by legendary voice actor Kevin Michael Richardson. Oh, how I've wanted to deck all of you! Fitting the popularity and importance of the character, the Joker appears the most of any villain, 19 of the 65 episodes, and even pops up in the direct-to-video movie The Batman vs. Dracula. Now there is only room for one Batman in Gotham. Oh yeah, the Batman fights Dracula. What are you waiting for, a miracle? The Joker's best solo episode, in my humble opinion, is season two's Strange Minds, in which Batman has to enter a virtual version of the Joker's mind to get info on the location of a kidnapped victim. It's weird and creepy and sad in just the way you'd hope. The villain with the second most appearances in The Batman is the Penguin. And I have to say, I never cared about the Penguin in Batman the Animated Series. Sure, Paul Williams' performance was great, but none of the Penguin-centric episodes really did much for me. He appeared in Almost Got Him, and that's the best episode ever, and he works well in that context. But I've Got a Batman in My Basement is one of the show's worst. Here, I think the Penguin might be my favorite villain. Voiced by, of all people, SpongeBob himself, Tom Kenny. Yes, money. The Penguin is as funny as he is dangerous. One of the most genius things they did was not change his physicality from what we all generally accept as the Penguin, but they made him a master hand-to-hand -hand combatant. His gimmick umbrellas help him hold his own against Batman and other villains like Man-Bat or Mr. Freeze. I like him so much, it's hard for me to pick a favorite episode. Maybe Pets or Team Penguin, but they're all great. Professor Hugo Strange becomes a major recurring character in the show. At first, he's merely the chief psychiatrist at Arkham Asylum, but as the series progresses, we learn more and more that he's up to nefarious deeds and even partakes in the series finale. He has seven on-screen appearances on this show. Catwoman, voiced by Gina Gershon, appears five times, and honestly, I wish it were more. This version visually plays much more into the burglar aesthetic, i.e. a much more functional outfit for robbery and the dynamic between this version of Catwoman and Batman is right away great. The attraction is instant, but both are unwilling to meet the other on their own terms. Selina Kyle also thinks Bruce Wayne is a drip, and I love that stuff. From there, all the other major villains appear exactly four times each. Bane, Black Mask, Firefly, Harley, Killer Croc, Man Bat. All of these have distinct twists, but four villains specifically I want to highlight. First of these is Mr. Freeze. It's really tough to follow up the TAS version because it's the best version of the character literally ever. Prior to TAS, Mr. Freeze was a joke. But, but, but you were supposed to be a famous Frosty Freezy by now. The earlier cartoon made him a tragic figure, losing his humanity in an attempt to save his wife. This backstory very quickly became the canon Mr. Freeze, even in the otherwise ridiculous Schwarzenegger version from Batman and Robin. Soon we will be together once more. The Batman's version of Freeze didn't try to mimic the earlier one, giving him a drastically different story. Victor Freeze here was just a petty thief who fell into a freezing pod. Just go with it. Emerging later as a Sub-Zero monster, Mr. Freeze swears revenge on the Dark Knight and becomes a mercenary for hire. It's definitely a less exciting take, but the visual design, with Freeze's eyes and silhouette visible beneath a jagged berg of ice, is super rad. And who voices this version of Mr. Freeze? Only mother f***ing Clancy Brown, the Kurgan himself. It's better to burn out than to fade away. Next up, Poison Ivy is a drastic reimagining. This version of Pamela Isley is a teenager and friend of Barbara Gordon. 
She and Barbara initially go on eco-rights and environmental raids. Eventually, Pam's passion for plants leads her to putting herself, Barbara, and others in mortal peril, and she succumbs to an experimental plant toxin, giving her the usual poison ivy powers. Something this show does that I really appreciate is not to objectify its female villains, or really any characters. For all of his greatness, the Bruce Timm design aesthetic for women definitely veers toward cheesecake pinups. Poison Ivy in Batman the Animated Series started out as the sexy plant lady. Here, she's a young teenager, and thus this kid show just lets her be a kid, albeit a villainous kid. Number three, we have The Riddler. It's tough to write compelling riddles, to which the creators of the Arkham series can attest. It's for this reason, despite being one of the fan favorite villains of Batman the Animated Series, The Riddler only appeared in three BTAS episodes and a mere supporting appearance in the new Batman adventures. In that series, The Riddler was a game designer who gets ripped off. In The Batman, he's more or less Jigsaw, using his vast intellect and ability to design complex problems to rig his rival's home with traps. And he looks like a goth rocker. Much like the later film The Batman, the animated The Batman sends Riddler into a horror vein. To complete that idea, the Riddler's voice is provided by none other than Robert England, Freddy Krueger himself. He doesn't call anyone bitch, but it's still pretty cool. And finally, we have a villain whose existence is a bit of a spoiler. If you're worried, go to this time code or go back in time 20 years. So, as I said previously, the creators of the Batman were unable to use Harvey Dent slash Two-Face in the series. This is a major bummer considering how superb the story of Bruce Wayne's friend and a stalwart upholder of law and order falling to the dark side is. But what they could do is take that idea and weave their own version of a classic baddie. In season one, we don't have Jim Gordon at all. We have two detectives. Ethan Bennett, voiced by Steve Harris, is Bruce Wayne's childhood friend and a longtime Gotham PD employee. As the series begins, he gets a new partner in the form of Ellen Yin, voiced by Ming-Na Wen, a transfer from Metropolis. As the season progresses, Bennett more and more begins to trust the Batman while Yin keeps thinking he's a criminal no matter the results. While attempting to capture Joker on his own at Rojas' urging, Bennett gets himself captured and subjected to mental and physical torture. While Batman saves Bennett, the cop finds himself changed. Joker's new nerve toxin warps Bennett's mind and makes his flesh pliable and controlled via thought. That's right, Bennett becomes Clayface, a complete departure from canon, but a fascinating riff for the cartoon. Part three, the voices. I've already mentioned several voice actors who play characters in the Batman, but one thing I haven't yet mentioned is how many people who play characters in other Batman media pop up in the Batman to voice totally different characters. It's a delight and I shall break it down for you now. Ron Perlman voiced Clayface in Batman the Animated Series and here plays a Cajun fried Killer Croc. Well, folks are gonna start hearing about how Killer Croc stopped you good. Clancy Brown, who voiced Lex Luthor in Superman the Animated Series and Justice League, here plays Mr. Freeze. Peter McNichol voices Dr. Kirk Langstrom, AKA Man Bat in the Batman, but would go on to play Mad Hatter in the Arkham video games. Hinden Walsh, who voiced Starfire in Teen Titans, voices Harley Quinn in this series and went on to voice Harley in several other projects hereafter. Brandon Routh, who played Superman in Superman Returns, and Ray Palmer in the Arrowverse, here plays Everywhere Man, one of the more forgettable baddies. Will Friedle, who played Terry McGinnis in Batman Beyond, plays the one-off villain Gearhead here. Phil Lamar, voice of Green Lantern John Stewart in Justice League, appears as Maxi Zeus in The Batman. Diedrich Bader, who'd go on to play Batman in the show's follow-up, Batman the Brave and the Bold, voiced supervillain Captain Slash, Shadow Thief, and Black Mask Henchman Number 1, in The Batman. He also voices Harvey Dent in Batman Cape Crusader. The great Adam West, and how come Batman doesn't dance anymore? Who played Batman in the 1966 show and several cartoons after, as well as the Grey Ghost in Batman the Animated Series, plays Mayor Grange in The Batman. So he's two mayors at the same time. Somebody's stealing my water. Frank Gorshin, who played the Riddler in Batman 66, played Dr. Hugo Strange in The Batman for the character's first few appearances before the actor's sad passing. And now the big ones. Kevin Batman Conroy and Mark Joker Hamill, the two big names from Batman the Animated Series, returned to play Dick Grayson's father John Grayson and villain Tony Zuko, respectively, in the season four premiere that introduced Robin. That is, if you ask me, cool as f Part four, the seasons. Each of the five seasons consists of 13 episodes, making a total of 65. Within the seasons, we have clear delineations of style and narrative focus, with the first two seasons forming a kind of arc, seasons three and four forming an arc, and season five on its lonesome. We'll get into what those mean momentarily. The first two seasons of The Batman had a shred-filled opening theme by none other than known beanie model The Edge from U2. 
The theme song is moody and fits the general tone of the series. It also only has one lyric right at the end where the edge goes, the Batman. And if you can believe it, that gets stuck in my head. That. As the first season begins, we find Batman having already made a difference in the crime rate with an embarrassed Chief Rojas putting detectives Bennett and Yin on the case of tracking him down. The season wastes no time giving us what we want and showcasing the new rogues gallery. We get three Joker eps, two Penguin eps, plus Catwoman, Bane, Mr. Freeze, Man Bat, Firefly, Ventriloquist, and Clayface. Clue Master is the only, huh? Okay, sure villain of the bunch, and even that's not a bad episode. By the end of the first season, with Detective Bennett fully clay facerid Batman and Detective Yin begin an uneasy alliance. He even gives her a communicator to work together on cases. I really dig this relationship, which continues apace throughout season two. Season two introduces Dr. Hugo Strange as the stealth villain running Arkham Asylum and features a number of villain team-ups of last season's baddies, as well as introducing Riddler, Killer Croc, Solomon Grundy, Ragdoll, who's that, and Spellbinder. The arc of the season is all about strengthening Batman and Yin's unsteady alliance and attempting to bring down supervillains together under the nose of Chief Rojas's growing resolve to get Batman. Eventually, Rojas learns Yin has been helping Batman, costing her her badge and putting both of them on the wand list. In the finale of the season, in a story which saw Joker, Penguin, and Riddler all attempting to bump off Batman for control of Gotham's underworld, Commissioner James Gordon, played by the X-Files' Mitch Pileggi, appears on the scene and overrules Rojas, reinstates Yin, and declares Batman a friend of law and order in the city. Because why not? As exciting as it is to see Jim Gordon join the fray, the finale of season two marks the final appearance of Detective Ellen Yin, who vanishes before the next season without any fanfare. For my money, seasons one and two are the best of the Batman because of Batman operating outside the law. His eventual partnership is hard earned and feels like a culmination of everything we watched up to that point. Having Gordon swoop in and act like deus ex machina does take away some of the tension the series had early on, despite Pileggi's consistently good vocal performance. Season three is where we first meet Barbara Gordon, a teenager working with her friend Pamela Isley to disrupt factories that pollute the environment. As the two-part opener unfolds, Isley becomes Poison Ivy and Barbara becomes Batgirl. Batgirl is constantly trying to prove herself worthy of working with Batman, who at first wants little to do with this child wanting to be a crime fighter. Batgirl does eventually make herself into a valuable ally, even if Batman keeps her at arm's length. She appears in nine of the 13 episodes and squares off against the likes of Joker, Penguin, Catwoman, Gearhead, and Maxi Zeus. Season three's ending doesn't feel like a finale at all and sees Batman fight off an AI created by Hugo Strange that possesses the sum total of all of Arkham's criminal brains and cunning. The AI's name is Digitally Advanced Villain Emulator, or Dave. The big villain of your season, Dave, and Batgirl isn't even in this one. With season four, we have a drastic shift. While Dwayne Capizzi remained on as head writer, he was joined by Michael Jelinek, making the jump from storyboard artist and episode writer. They started to draw Batman with a more square jaw instead of the pointed chin of the first three seasons. It's a weird thing to notice, but once you do, you can't look away. Because of Teen Titans ending, like I said, the series could use Robin and use him they do and I kind of think to the detriment of what the series had built up. Dick Grayson has his typical origin story with the flying Graysons and all that, only here he's younger than Barbara Gordon, giving him a little brother syndrome. After Batman takes in Dick and the two begin their Batman and Robin partnership, Batgirl takes a back seat almost immediately. In the episode Team Penguin, Batgirl learns about Robin, sees that the boy has already gotten training from Batman, and knows the secret identity. She is, understandably, pretty miffed. Batman does very quickly make amends, taking her back to the Batcave and fully bringing her in, and that'd be all well and good, except from here on, Batgirl only appears in 12 episodes in the rest of the series, while Robin appears in double that, effectively all but two in the whole rest of the show. And yes, I am aware Robin was always Batman's full-time sidekick, but this show is playing with Batman canon and chronology already, so you'd at least hope Batgirl could keep showing up with the same frequency and make the Bat family actually feel like one. Even with this caveat, season four has some banger episodes. The aforementioned Team Penguin has the newly minted Bat trio take on Penguin's team of villains including Killer Croc, Firefly, Ragdoll, and a very silly version of Killer Moth. In what I'm sure was a complete inside joke, voice actor Jeff Bennett does an Emo Phillips impression to voice Killer Moth, and it is such a weird choice, and I love it. Special Ops Moth approached. <coughs> 
Strange New World sees the city turn into a zombie cesspool thanks to Dr. Hugo Strange's latest toxin, with only Batman able to administer an antidote. The great Paul Dini guest writes the episode Two of a Kind, which introduces this show's version of Harley Quinn, a daytime TV psychiatrist with a talk show. And Rumors has the dynamic duo facing a Gotham City whose villains keep disappearing. Beginning, however, with the fourth season's two-part finale, I feel as though the show starts to go down the wrong path. In between seasons four and five, Kapitzi and Jelinek left the Batman and were replaced by DCAU alum Alan Burnett. Burnett had worked on Batman, Superman, New Batman, and Batman Beyond, and while he's super talented, his taking over shifted the focus of the series away from Batman and toward various Justice League team members. By this time, it was 2007 and Justice League Unlimited had wrapped. This meant the Batman had no bat embargo at all. The two-part season four finale, The Joining, introduced an alien invasion and brought in members of the Justice League, including Martian Manhunter, Green Lantern, Flash, Green Arrow, and Hawkman. The season five premiere, The Superman Batman Story, brought back George Newbern as the voice of Superman from Justice League, along with Clancy Brown as Lex Luthor, in an episode where he also voices Mr. Freeze. Uh, what a choice. Most of season five then features guest appearances by a Justice Leaguer who teams up with Batman to take on one of their villains. This would, of course, set the template for Batman the Brave and the Bold, which began in 2011. And it's a great concept for that series. Here, it weirdly felt off. This Batman doesn't need the Justice League, and for a show that spent so much time with its titular hero Solo, with occasional aid, having him constantly take a back seat to guest characters is a weird kind of betrayal. If they wanted to make a Justice League series in this universe, they should have just done that. Part 5, In Summation Despite ending on a sour note, I still think the Batman is supremely worth your time. For me, the first two seasons are nearly perfect, feeling refreshingly different from the DCAU and presenting new and unique iterations of these characters we all know intimately. Seasons three and four feel a lot more conventional, but still keeping with the general tone, despite bringing up the humor ever so slightly. Season three is my preference of these two, but it's good to see Robin, even if it means Batgirl takes a backseat. And if you ask me, I think you can stop watching with the season four episode Rumors, which very nicely ties up Batman's story with his various villains. The one downside, of course, is that Batgirl isn't in the episode, but it features all the major antagonists, and that's super fun. I mean, if you really want to hear Dermot Mulroney play Hal Jordan, then I'd say watch the remaining 15 episodes, but no, they aren't in the same league. Yes, I did it on purpose. The Batman tried to bring to animation the early days of the Dark Knight for a new generation of viewers who were all just about to see Christian Bale put on the cowl. It's a chapter in Batman's animated life that is often forgotten when put between the behemoth that was the DCAU and the Silver Age fun of the Brave and the Bold. And certainly I can't sit here and say The Batman is even in the same ballpark of quality as Batman the Animated Series, but 20 years on, it feels much more exciting than it might have when it premiered. If you like The Spectacular Spider-Man or Wolverine and the X-Men, two other animated series constantly overshadowed by 90s juggernauts, I would say give The Batman a try. But tell me, what do you think? Did you watch The Batman in 2004 or were you just not born yet? What's your best and worst villain redesign from the series? And who bought Reno Romano's house? Surprise, it was me! Just kidding, I can't afford a house. Let us know in the comments below. Thanks for watching, and watch more awesome sh** on Nerdist.com. The Batman. It's an earworm. Do you like magic? Do you like witches? Do you like the childlike empress from the never-ending story, Tammy Stronach? Then you're in luck, because Man and Witch, The Dance of a Thousand Steps is coming to a theater near you. When a lonely goat herd discovers he's been cursed at birth to never take a wife, he makes a bargain with a reclusive witch to reverse the spell, only to find that if he can't complete her three impossible tasks, he will never find true love. Be careful what you witch for, am I right? Man and Witch opens in theaters nationwide for two nights only, July 28th and 30th with Fathom Events. Get your tickets now at manandwitch.com. And for fans of tabletop role-playing games, you, the producers of Man and Witch are cooking up an original one-shot adventure inspired by the film releasing this fall. Visit manandwitch.com for details.